Hi, I'm Carla Nappi, and I'm the writer and creator of the comic book series Duplicate and the upcoming anthology Curio, A History of Historical Oddities. You can find me at carlanappi.com or on Twitter or Instagram at Musings by Crazed. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, or when Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented writer. She is also a the creator of the comic Duplicant. We are joined today by the ever-talented Carla Nappi. How are you doing today, Carla? Good. How are you doing? <laughs> doing wonderful. You know, for uh, for an early Saturday morning here on, on Two Geeks Talking, it's great to have you on the show here. I, I got to read your comic. I loved the character interactions, the the colors are beautiful, and the story is really like it really drives home. I unfortunately got to read uh, two episodes here, and I'm I'm hearing that you're doing more as well, two issues I should say, and you're doing more as well too. But I'm jumping ahead of things here. I apologize <laughs> for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, and of course what you are creating and coming on the show for. Tell us who you are and what you're all about. So I'm Carla Nappi, and I'm the writer and creator of Duplicant, which has five issues right now. And I'm working on the graphic novel to, that'll wrap up the first arc. And then at some point in the future, when I have time, I'll work on the second arc of the stories. That's Vela behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm also working on an anthology right now called Curio, a collection of historical oddities that I'm hoping to get off the ground soon. Um, I have a couple other projects that I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about, but I have other things brewing. And my animated series that I created was Sapphire Sandalo. Uh, she came to me looking for help bringing her vision to life. We're trying to find a showrunner for that now. And then I also have a kid's book that's been kind of sitting on the back burner, but I'm hoping to get back to soon. So it's safe to say you're a little busy. A little busy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's start off with, with the Duplicant series itself here. The one thing I really enjoyed was the way you developed your world. And I thought that was that was a really key aspect about getting me, at least as a reader, invested in the actual series itself. And I definitely have to read the other issues as well, too. I apologize. But I really <laughs> think that's a wonderful story. And I could see this as, as an animated or even a possible live action as well, too. It, it was just too really well done. Thank you. I initially created it as a uh, pilot scripts back when I was trying to get staffed as a television writer. You know, at the time, it was like the hot thing to try to create like a short one off comic book script to just help visualize what you were looking in this world to be, especially if it was something high concept like duplicate. Mm -hmm. And so I started taking comic book writing classes at Meltdown Comics in West Hollywood. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I love this. It was such a great challenge. And I realized that I didn't want to do just a one-off script. I wanted to develop this into a series. And so if, like, if you read Duplicate, the pilot script, and then you read the series, they're similar, but they're also very, very different. Because in the pilot script, Pamela was just a one-off character in one scene. She came and went, and that was it. And in the series, she's been developed, and she's like a major part of this, the entire series. Hi, Bella. You, can, <laughs> you can't like do the series without her now. She's so integral. It just kind of unlocked a bunch of stuff for me, and I felt like all the stuff I had been working on my whole life with film and TV helped prepare me to be able to write for comic books. I'm sure it must have been extremely freeing as well, too, because especially when you're so used to uh, the structure from a script to a comic book is similar. The fact that you're able to see your characters come to life, so to speak, in a comic book medium must have been incredible. As the writer, though, how did you find, who's your artist and your team, and, and how did you find them? My editor on the first issue was Vince Hernandez, and he's the editor-in-chief over at Aspen Comics. And I met him because I went to a panel at Long Beach Comic Con where they had a panel about editors. And I was trying to learn as much as I could about comics. So in addition to the class I had taken at Meltdown, I was also going to as many panels as I could at all the different conventions that happened in California when I was still living in SoCal. I just ambushed <laughs> Vince after a panel. I don't remember what I said to him. And at that point, all I literally had was the script for the first issue of Duplicate. I didn't have any art, I had nothing. And so he was really integral to helping me be able to bring this vision to life. He helped hook me up with Josh Reed, 
Josh Reed did my logo for Duplicant. He also did the lettering and the production work on the first issue of Duplicant before he got hired over at DC. And then he wasn't allowed to do any work <laughs> on outside projects. Um, but he helped hook me up with Carlos, who has done the lettering and production work on Duplicant ever since then. Uh, Leila Del Duca came to me by way of Him Kartak. He has a book out now called, he did Boy One with Dark Horse and now... He has another book about people having to leave Earth and going to Mars, and that's out with Scout. That's great. And so he had used Layla on Boy One. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I was able to hook up with Layla, and she did all the covers. Mariana was my friend Rylan Grant, and he has Suicide Jockeys out right now. He's done like Aberrant and Banjax, and he has so many series out right now. He's got a new one coming out with, uh, I want to say it's called Feng Shei. He was at that class I took Mm -hmm. at Meltdown Comics. So he helped hook me up with Mariana. And Mariana is based out of Poland. I've actually never spoken to her on the phone. We only deal by email because she's not comfortable enough with her English to do phone calls or video chats. So it's like literally just been emails back and forth for years and years and years (laughs) at this point. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, Raylan was actually on the show uh, uh, last year. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> we, uh, we talked about suicide jockeys and uh, yeah, he, he's wonderful. Love, love chatting with him. And I get, you know what the thing is with Rylan and Steven, he was also in the class we took too, is we all read each other's scripts. So I've read every single script he's ever written for any of his comic book projects before they even get drawn because we all use each other for notes on our stuff. It's great to have a community like that. I, I'm not even diving into my questions yet, but it's, it's great that, <laughs> that you have a, a wonderful community like that of, of like-minded individuals that want to create amazing comics and, and are very talented in, in many different facets. Uh, looking at yourself as, as a writer then, what is the hardest part about the process? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end for you? I would say it's motivating myself to sit down and actually write is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on issues four and five, and Mariana will attest to this because I ended up like being so late, especially on issue five for her. And it was such a bigger script than normal. You know, normally my scripts are like 23 pages and I want to say this one, the initial draft came in at almost 40 pages and we realized there was no way she was going to have time to do that much. So I think we cut it down to like maybe 32 or 34 but that was still a lot for her in a very short period of time. Once I can sit down to write and I'm in that zone, it's fine. But sometimes I have a really hard time with that. And I think part of that is just like, I have anxiety and depression and that always makes things harder uh, depending on how I am. And then, you know, sometimes I just get caught in my head. Like, I'm like, oh my God, my Kickstarter didn't do well. Everyone hated the previous issue. No one wants to read my work type of thing. So it's just getting myself out of that headspace so I can write. What is your creative kryptonite? I would say it's my anxiety and my depression. Because <laughs> if I get caught in my head, then I just can't sit down and write. I'm very subject to, I would say my self-esteem is better now than it was when I was a kid. But if I feel like people don't like what I've done, I can get really trapped on that. And that'll make it hard for me to write too. <laughs> Usually what I end up having to do to kind of get myself out of my head is I just have to like organize my house. Like (laughs) is the laundry put away? Is like everything cleaned up? Like just like a clean, happy space where I don't have to worry about anything. Like I don't have any extraneous projects that I have to like do. And then I can just sit and focus and think, you know, I'm making sure that my kid is is happy because like if he's having a fit about being away from me, that's obviously harder to get in the zone when your kid's screaming for you. Yeah. And then once I start to write, I'm usually fine. Like I'm an incredibly fast writer when I can sit down and write. I wrote issue five in probably like two weeks oh, wow. once I started writing it. And I wouldn't say that I changed much after that first draft. Like there are tweaks and things, but I was in such a good zone with that script. That script didn't have to go through a lot of changes. Like issue four was probably one of my hardest because it did have to go through a lot of revisions with, especially with the dialogue. And issue two was a particularly hard one. That one went through a lot of revisions, but if I'm in a really good zone and I'm feeling good and positive and like what I'm writing is good, then I often can get it done very fast. And then I don't typically need a lot of revisions. Looking at Duplicant, then what was the first seed of the story or image maybe that popped into your head that eventually turned into Duplicant? 
Well, there were two movies that inspired me to do uh, Duplicate. It was Minority Report, Mm because I always loved just the arc of that with Tom Cruise's character and how he has this like one person in his life who he's been holding on to desperately since his son disappeared. And that person has completely betrayed him and all of humanity, so to speak. And then, and he's trying desperately to do like the right thing and everything is going wrong for him. And then the other one was Repo the Genetic Opera. I really was taken with the idea of you have to get like a replacement kidney. And if you don't pay for it, someone comes and takes it out of you in the middle of the night. So I kind of wanted to take the character arc from Minority Report and then take that idea of like a repo men for organs and just do my own spin on it. Plus, I mean, Anthony Stewart has just an amazing singer. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, who knew? (laughs) (laughs) Two amazing films, truly. Uh, And I I got to see Repo the Genetic Opera. Actually, I think I have it on Blu-ray and I pop that in every so often. It's it's an incredibly underrated film, I think. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've done a lot in your career as a writer itself. What is the one thing that has been a feather in your cap and what is one thing that you wished you could have got off the ground that hasn't quite gotten you? I would say duplicate right now is the feather in my cap because it's like my first big thing that I've done all on my own. I mean my first real professional writing credit was on suits but when you're working on a tv show a lot of what you write is not your own words so like if you looked at my first draft that I submitted of that episode that aired and then you looked at the draft that ultimately got filmed There's very little of what I wrote left in what's filmed. And I don't think a lot of people realize that in film and TV, the writer who gets the credit isn't always the one that ends up writing most of what's on screen. And that was weird for me to learn that because it felt oddly dishonest. (laughs) Like I'm getting credit for all this stuff that I didn't ultimately write. (laughs) And like, you know, kudos and thanks for things that like my boss wrote. It was weird. So I felt like more comfortable once I moved into comics. Well, it's also discouraging too. It's just part of the process. Most shows in my 15 years of like working in film and TV and working in the writer's rooms and everything, it's just the way it's done. It's not like what happened to me was unusual. Every writer goes through this. Every single writer has their stuff completely rewritten (laughs) before it goes on screen. So I would say duplicate is the feather in my cap. And then the thing I wish I had gotten off the ground As much as I found the process of writing and TV odd because so much of what you write isn't what is on screen, um, I really wish I had been given a chance to become a staff writer. It's a very frustrating process to become a staff writer in film and TV. There's people who kind of fall into it with no work or effort at all on their part. And then there's people like me, and there's a lot of them, uh, if you follow the Pay Up Hollywood movement on Twitter, who worked for like decades <laughs> trying to break in and they just, they're just seen as support staff and they're never given that chance. I always find nameology fascinating because a creative person, no matter who they are, there's always usually a name or a unique name or, or something that kind of sticks in their mind when they're creating, like in your case for Duplicant, you know, how did you come up with the names of your characters and what did you draw from to make those? Well, Matt Travers, the name was inspired uh, by the lead character, Will Travers from Rubicon, because that was one of the TV shows I had worked on. I really loved that show. It was one of my favorite shows to work on, even though it had a lot of drama (laughs) behind the scenes, unfortunately. (laughs) If you work in film and TV, there's always a lot of drama behind the scenes. That was part of my inspiration for that name. And then for the rest of them, part of my job as like a script coordinator was coming up with names for the characters and coming up with names for like the businesses and anything. Because when you work as a script coordinator, if the initial names, the creators, the writers came up with don't clear, then you're usually tasked with trying to find different names. So I would normally just go on to like the different baby name websites, or if we were looking for a specific like ethnic group, or they're supposed to come from a specific country, then I would just try to look for names through those types of websites. And then I would just try to find something that just sounded right. (laughs) A lot of what I do with my writing, I don't follow the typical arc of like, okay, my inciting incident has to happen on this exact page. And then, you know, the break has to happen on this page. I find that very restrictive to my ability to write. A lot of it is just based on like, does it feel right? Does it flow right? Does it feel like it's moving in the right way? I don't know how else to describe it. So a lot of that has to come up with the names too. Like, does it just feel like the person I've created? Hi, Bella. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a writer, what's the most misunderstood aspect about your profession for those that maybe don't understand 
what a writer actually is? I think it depends on where you work as a writer, what sort of uh, stereotypes you're running into. I mean, I know when I started working in film and TV, it's kind of going off topic, but I'll bring it back to the topic. <laughs> when I was little, I really wanted to be like a singer or a comedian or an actor. I my parents were not very supportive of that, I think because they were worried and they knew that that type of work can be very difficult. But when I started going more into behind the scenes work, because at the time I was looking more to do editing, they were more supportive of that because in their mind, that was a more safe road to go. You know, I got into NYU and I think they thought I was gonna go through this great school and come out and just land a well high paying job. It's just not the way it works with any job <laughs> in the industry. So it's kind of like the same thing. And then the union also trips people up too. Like my grandfather worked his whole life for IBEW, which is the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. So whenever he needed work, he would just go to the union hall and they would send him out on a job. So to him, when I got into the Writers Guild, he was like, well, you just go to the union hall. <laughs> you, they'll just assign you a job. And I'm like, no, nah, that's not how it works. I think a lot of people think when you work in film and TV, if they don't really understand the mechanics of how it works, they think it's a great glamorous job and you're earning a lot of money. I don't know how many people were aware of the IATSE negotiations that were going on or pay up Hollywood, but I feel like that kind of opened people up more to realizing that like, we don't really have the best, most glamorous job. It's hard work and it's physically hard and mentally hard. And you're often not paid well. And it's not this glamorous place to work all the time. I mean, the parties can be nice, but that doesn't really make up for all the other stuff you're forced to deal with. When it comes to comic books, what's been interesting to me is when I explain to people how it works, like you have to have a publisher and then you have to get into Diamond. And then Diamond is one of the main entities that controls distribution to the stores and that you don't really get paid that much. Like you're lucky if you get like a small percentage of profits. For people who are used to how novels work, they don't understand it at all because it's completely <laughs> different. Like you're paid up front. They're like, wait, and you have to pay to make your book? Like, why are you even with a publisher if you have to pay to make your book? Like, what's the point? Hi, Bella. Like, they just don't understand it. They're like, you have to pay everything to make your book and then they just publish it. it it's such a weird universe. And then the other thing is, I think people who don't understand how these different industries work completely... They think I'm making like a bunch of money because my Kickstarters are going well. And I'm like, no, literally every dime goes towards either the production of the work. So like that's the artwork, the lettering, you know, all that stuff, like my cover artist, all those fees. Cause it's probably like five to $7,000 for me to actually make an actual issue of the book. And then there's your supplies you know, your Gemini mailers, your bags and boards, and then the printing and the shipping, which just keeps going up and up and up and up. So I have not made any money <laughs> off of comic books. And that's just the way it is. In your opinion, what is the most important quality as a writer? And how does that translate to your comic? I would say the most important trait as a writer is just to keep at it. If you don't write and you don't create and you don't push yourself to kind of go out of your comfort zone, just do something creative, then nothing's going to happen. Because if it doesn't come out of your head and onto the page and get made, no one's going to know what you're thinking in your head. I say that to my son a lot. He'll get mad at me about something and I'll be like, did did you say it in your head or did you say it out loud? And he'll be like, I just said it in my head. I'm like, I can't hear your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing with anything creative. If you don't take it out of your head and put it down, it's not going to exist anywhere but there. <laughs> I was in IT for 20 years. So, you know, we, we didn't become mind readers then either. So it just. No. You know. And that was a big thing with film and TV. So it's like every industry has that. I'm like, did you say it out loud? <laughs> That needs to be on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so then what was the hardest scene for you to write in your current issues of Duplicate? Oh, that's a good question. Issue five, and I don't want to give too much away, but there's like a big confrontation scene and it's split up into a couple different parts. That was difficult to write to get the tone correct because Matt goes on such a big journey people still have sympathy for this character considering everything that's going on and everything that's happening. And a lot of it is out of his control, but a lot of it is also like, why didn't he do more? So it's a fine line to walk to make sure that it doesn't feel like he didn't do enough when he could have. Now, 
and not lose sympathy for him. So that's difficult. There were some scenes with Pamela that kind of deal more with the spiritual side or religious side, depending on where you are with your belief systems. And that was difficult to write, to get correct. But one of the things that gave me confidence in writing those was because I knew Mariana would do amazing work to make the visuals that I envisioned come to life and help tell that part of the story. Out of all the scenes that you you wrote down in your script and you handed it off to your artists, when you received the artwork back, what scene blew you out of the water when you finally saw it in an art form? I would say, you know what, it was probably the first test page I had her do. So In issue one, the test page that I had her do, uh, and I don't want to give too much away for people who might maybe haven't read the comic book yet. It's a scene in which Pamela finally realizes that things are going to completely blow up for her in a way she did not realize when it comes to her boss. And it was a very emotional scene. And a lot of it, there is some dialogue there, but it's dialogue of the past. And so we're kind of seeing her in the future after these events but the dialogue from the past is overlapping the images. And so that was her test page. And I knew that if she could nail that test page, because it's such an emotional page and you really have to get what's going across with the person's face, then she could nail the entire book. And so I would say that would be the first one that blew me away. Out of all the issues you've created then, was there a scene that you edited out that you wish you could have kept in? The only time I've ever had to edit a scene out was in issue five. And that was simply because we just didn't have room for it. It was a scene with Sean and his family. And it's critical to the story, but it wasn't critical to that issue. So I still have it written and it'll it'll appear in a future issue, but I was bummed that we had to cut it. It really came down to more to like logistics. We could have kept it in. It wouldn't have hurt the issue, but it would have hurt the timing of everything and the budget. It would have been better in another issue. It's not that it would have been bad in this issue, but it would be better in a future issue. But otherwise, I've never had to cut a scene from any of my scripts. This means you're a very solid writer, so that works (laughs) very well. (laughs) What is an early experience where you learned that language had power? I mean, the first time I ever kind of got a compliment on my writing, and I wish I could remember specifically what the heck I had written, I was probably in like second grade, I want to say. And I had a teacher tell me that I was a a good writer. And that kind of stuck in my head as something. You know, I had other things that I had done when I was younger that kind of told me that I might be good at writing, but I didn't really get any confidence to do my writing until I was much, much much older. <laughs> well, sorry, what is your favorite unappreciated novel? Oh, that's a good question. It's it's not The Handmaid's Tale, but there's a I think it's Margaret. by I think it's by her. It blew, completely blew me away. Yes, The Blind Assassin. I thought that was such an amazing book. I have never heard anyone else talk about it. Actually, I'm shocked that it's never been made into a movie. But it's kind of one of I love books that kind of span a bunch of different time periods and unfold what's happening kind of by jumping back and forth through time. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's a mystery and yet it's not. And I also thought it was really cool because it has like newspaper articles scattered throughout. So it's kind of like unfolding in this really awesome, I I don't want to say convoluted because convoluted implies that it was confusing and it wasn't confusing, but it was definitely a mind bender, but in the best way possible. Yeah, and it's from, I want to say it's from like 2000, I think, is when it came out. How many half-finished scripts do you have? I would say I have quite a few. (laughs) (laughs) I have quite a few, and mostly they're like short stories I was trying to do, or when I was trying to like get in to see if I could write plays, that type of thing, or Mm -hmm. features. Features to me are are very, very hard to write, so that's mainly what I have that's half finished anything when it came to comics or pilot scripts are all finished but yeah short stories novels <laughs> like anything like that it was been really hard to try to keep that sort of mental gymnastic going to finish something like that at what point are we good enough 
when you feel like you're good enough, you just have to be able to feel like you are good enough and not keep kicking yourself. (laughs) What in life is beautiful to you? Oh, when my son laughs, when he's happy. Yeah, I would say most of it has to do with my kid at this point, now that I've become a mom. I just try to enjoy nature more now than I did when I was little because, you know, I lived in California for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back here for visits, and then when I eventually moved back here for financial reasons, one of the things that I didn't realize I hadn't appreciated as a kid was spring. Look at all the trees have all these beautiful flowers. I was like, how did I not really pay attention to this as a kid and a teenager and being in my twenties growing up in this area? Like it was just like, it just flew by my face and I just didn't really appreciate it. And then when I moved back, I was like, oh my God, this is so pretty. Why didn't I like stop and enjoy this? What is the second wisest piece of advice that someone said to you that has stuck with you in your career? In my career, I can tell you about something, advice I got that stuck with me with parenting. (laughs) Um, So Stephen Prince, he's one of the creators uh, that I reference that I'm friends with. He reads all my stuff. He does Monster Matador. And he lived up the street from me when I lived in California. And he had a kid who wasn't that much older than me. And he told me, you'll get into a routine and then everything will change. He said, everything will constantly change. He's like, you'll pr- probably feel like, all right, I can handle this. This is good. And then it'll all change. <laughs> so I, that has been the, probably the best piece of advice I got because it's so true because we would just get into a routine. I'd be like, all right, we can handle this. We got this down. We're good. And then it would all change. And I feel like life is like that too sometimes, just in general. You feel like you've gotten it down. Everything's good. And then life just throws you a curveball. <laughs> Darn you, life. Darn you. Darn you. (laughs) Hi, Bella. Mm. Hi. What lessons in life did you learn the hard way? You know what? Here's another piece of advice I got. And I would say this is like a hard way one is I had this therapist once, I think I was in my teens, who said, don't shit where you sleep. (laughs) Because that's exactly what I had been doing at that point in my life. And I I didn't really understand that I didn't have like the self-reflection or understanding to really understand that that's what I had been doing. And so once I actually understood that and could grasp that, that was a really good piece of advice that anyone can take. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? That's a good question. Um, I would say the thing that made me start to really take my writing more seriously and try to keep at it was my friend, Jesse, which I actually have a picture right up here. So Jesse was this great guy that I worked with uh, when I worked in New York City still as a script coordinator and assistant. He died very young. He was hit by a car when he was crossing the street. Uh, The car was making an illegal turn. He was just in his 20s. He was about to move to California. He was a writer and a director. He just had so much, so much talent. And so when he died, it affected me greatly. Like it was absolutely traumatizing when he passed away as it was to everyone who knew him. So when when he passed away, his mom wanted to start a foundation in his name. She wanted to find some sense out of what had happened. And so I helped her with starting up this nonprofit in his name called JT3 Arts. Uh, that helps aspiring filmmakers, especially filmmakers of color, you know, filmmakers from minority communities, filmmakers who basically weren't being kind of given the same leg up as everyone else might have been. That was a thing that like, I didn't feel like I could do, but I pushed myself to do to help them out with that. And we had a really great program for a couple of years, but also having him die at such a young age when he had such promise and he was so close to being on the verge of doing so much greatness. And I was probably like 10 years older than him really made me be like, what the heck am I waiting for? Like, (laughs) what am I waiting for? I need to do this seriously. And he had always been such a big supporter and cheerleader of my own writing and trying to help me out with my own stuff that I didn't want to squander that hope that he had in my own career and my own abilities. And so I really kind of put my foot to the floor to be more active with my writing and doing more with what I wanted to do ultimately with my life, which was instead of just saying, I'm going to be a writer to actually become a writer. From a professional perspective, you are a writer. You're very talented about that. You've worked in film and television. You've created your own comic book series and you're creating many more 
amazing things that I'm sure I don't even know about. And you're very successful professionally in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I do or not. I actually don't know if I do, because, you know, I think the people who love what I do consider me professionally successful, but there's a lot of people who just in my own family that don't really understand what I do. And, and so it's like, how much do you take what they're thinking of as what you do, whether it's successful or not? Because I know in their estimation, they might think it's cool, <laughs> but they don't really see it as successful because like there's so many people in my family who don't even read what I write they just can't be bothered and that kind of always takes what I do down a notch in a sad way when the people who I feel like should be more supportive of my writing can't even be bothered to read what I write because they find it either like creepy or it's just not up their alley or whatever and I'm just like really like you can't just take (laughs) push yourself out of your comfort zone to read something I created. Well, the other thing that kind of made me feel like people didn't see me as successful in my family was when I became pregnant, the amount of praise I got for something that's completely out of my control. It's like my body's kind of doing its own thing. Like it does when it's keeping me alive, the amount of praise and like, oh my gosh, and excitement I got over a biological function compared to all this other stuff that I literally put my blood, sweat, and tears into, like the foundation for Jesse, very little support or acknowledgement for how much work that was or what it meant for me or for the community at large, for the people that I helped, or just even my writing stuff. Like, (laughs) I always just found that really weird. Like, where was this excitement for these things that I created out of my mind that came to life? It's very strange. Why do you think people don't support creative people as much as they should? Part of me wonders if part of it is fear. I feel like I read something recently about that, like the creative people just as they should be because there's some level of fear of what they do that they're able to like create these things in their mind and then bring them to life, like innovations and everything else from inventors to anyone who does anything creative. It's like they're not part of the collective, (laughs) so to speak. You know, I think if you can't understand something, if it feels like it's other or different, that that puts people off in some strange way. I've interviewed so many creative people in general that it's it's a common theme that if you're successful, people will flock to you. If you're unknown or an indie creator or, or whatever you may be, just trying to get your name out there, whoever it may be, they won't support you unless you do something big or huge. It's just sickening, to be honest. Yeah. And, it, you know, the, the ability to get that type of attention can really be so random, kind of like what I was saying about how, like, writers and TV can sometimes just fall into it mm-hmm. and others are working so hard and will be like, oh, they, what is it like the overnight success? And it's like that person was probably plugging away at this, doing stuff you just never knew of for decades, potentially. (laughs) The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Chocolate. (laughs) Chocolate. And then just like, I'm trying not to kick myself too hard and try to just keep myself out of my own head. Sometimes my own head is the worst place to be if there's any type of failure. And then just also realizing as much as you don't want to take things personally, especially because it's something you've created. So that always is going to feel personal. A lot of the times you have to just separate how people feel about your work or whatever success you have. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard one, especially when it's something creative. (laughs) We're already kicking ourselves while, when we're down, you don't have to add to it. Yeah. yeah, Don't put the salt in the wound and rub it in. (laughs) The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you, uh, and they may become creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or maybe something else creative entirely that, that you do or you don't do. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a tough one, especially with the world we're living in right now. What I try to teach my son, who I guess would be that generation following the younger generation right now, is just to have confidence in whoever he's going to be. You know, he's a kid who really loves to wear dresses and paint his nails and everything else. And we don't know what that's gonna mean for him down the road. 
And so I'm trying to keep people from telling him that how he feels and what he likes is wrong. And that's especially hard with where I live. <laughs> and it's especially hard with who my, some of my family members are. They're not uh, totally supportive of this journey that he's on, which has been difficult. And so a lot of it is just, you wanna be true to who you really are, who you feel you are, not who people tell you you should be. And that, that can be a very hard lesson to learn in the world that we live in. Because you're in the movie industry and TV industry and uh, you're a comic writer and everything along that line, you're, you're creative to the max, I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> what would be the film title or TV series of your life? And what would the music soundtrack be? Uh, well, if I go by what a therapist said once, it would be The Perils of Pauline. <laughs> I don't know if you know that series. Do you know that no, movie? Know that. Okay, so... Back when the film industry first started, when it was actually based in New Jersey and like Fort Lee and all those areas before it transferred over to Hollywood, there's all these cliffs in New Jersey called the Palisades. And so one of the things they would do is they would film all these movies where the heroine would be, it's like the mustache twirling mm -hmm. things where the heroine is like, oh no, please save me. You know, they're about to fall off the cliffs to their death until someone swoops in because like the bad guy has taken them or like they're tied to the railroad tracks. It's like that thing, like the heroine's always in some sort of like catastrophic trouble. I would say that I'm usually the one that is in some sort of catastrophic trouble. And then I have to often get myself out of it. It's not like I have someone swooping in to help me. That would be my life right now because I'm in a kind of stressful situation with taking care of my grandfather who has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the help from the family members who should be taking care of this stuff and have kind of left me holding the bag. <laughs> So that's kind of like my perils of falling right now. As far as the soundtrack, I would say probably something from Nine Inch Nails or maybe Guns N' Roses, but probably mm. Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> Sounds like something that you should create. <laughs> <laughs> Carla, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before I let you go, though, where can we find you? How can we support you online, social media, and any other websites you'd like to help promote? Uh, like you have down here on my little graphic, the Musings by Craze is where I am on Twitter and on Instagram. CarlaNappy.com is my website. Uh, Duplicant has a website on Facebook. It's facebook.com backslash duplicant comic as all one word. Well, I definitely want to have you back on the show in the future for sure, too. Please stop by anytime. You're always welcome. Thank you. And that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm having <laughs> website issues, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.